Shikigami have so many interesting uses in Jujutsu Kaisen, varying from healing to adapting to distracting and even to, um, whatever it is that Rika and Yuta do. The point is that Gege Akatami really leaned into the use of Shikigami, especially when he established Megami's 10 Shadows ability, and I am really glad that he did because I find some of them really damn cool. And because I find some of them so cool, I decided to rank every single Shikigami used in Jujutsu Kaisen, as well as give each of them a grade. Similar to Cursed Tools, Shikigami are a form of weapon utilised by a sorcerer, so in this ranking we're going to consider both their overall strength and how useful they are and how well they fight alongside their user. So let's get straight into ranking all of Jujutsu Kaisen's Shikigami. At number 20, we have got the old guy's foot Shikigami from the hidden inventory arc, and these things are just really strange. I'd say they're probably like grade 3, but honestly, who cares, I'm just gonna move straight on. At number 19, I'm putting Megami's toads, because all they really do is croak and stick their tongue out. Don't get me wrong, they're definitely useful for saving yourself and someone else from harm, but they just haven't really got the offensive, defensive, speed, or utility potential to be any higher up on the list. And naturally, number 18 will go to bottomless well, Gamma plus Nui, which is basically the exact same thing as toad, but with the wings of Nui. And for that reason I'm going to put them one spot higher than the normal toad simply because they've got better mobility due to having wings, but that's about it. Everything else is exactly the same. At number 17 we have Rabbit Escape, and honestly they are underrated as hell. They are literally hundreds of fast, well coordinated, kung fu wielding rabbits making for a perfect getaway distraction. That being said though, I can't give too much credit to a horde of bunnies designed to literally help you be a little bitch. They're also individually grade 4, except from Rabbit246. He's got some special grade potential. At number 16 we have Moondregs. Who the fuck is that guy? Exactly. Well, Moondregs is actually the poisonous jelly for Shikigami that belonged to Junpei Yoshino. All it really had was some spikes and poison which caused only temporary paralysis. It's definitely not terrible, but due to the limited screen time it had, it came across as slightly slow and honestly just underwhelming, especially when compared to some of the upcoming contenders. I'll give it a solid grade 2 and then just move on. At spot number 15, we have Megami's Orochi, the not-so-great serpent which was instantly exercised by a three-finger Sukuna. In all fairness though, Sukuna is just him. Even at three fingers, Orochi she didn't really stand a chance. But we still aren't really aware of any of its abilities and it got very little screen time. The only reason I've put it above Moondregs is because it's part of Megami's 10 Shadows technique and was used to save Nobara Kugisaki's life. Given our limited information, I will place it next to Moondregs in grade 2 and move on. At number 14, I'm placing Max Elephant. Megami tames the Shikigami halfway through season 1 of Jujutsu Kaisen and uses it to great effect against Noritoshi Kamo and later against Jiro in Shibuya. Despite burning through more cursed energy than previous 10 Shadows, it actually provides a good bit of utility. It's very heavy and can be summoned above opponents to literally just crush them. It also has the ability to release large quantities of water in its surrounding from its trunk. As we know, it's even stronger when wielded by a sorcerer with more cursed energy. When considering Megami's use of it though, I would place it at a semi-grade 1, maybe grade 2 level since its versatility is pretty limited. At number 13, I'm putting Nui, another of Megami's 10 shadows. And yes, this ranking is going to have a lot of Megami's 10 shadows because they're like 10 Shikigami and the main Shikigami in the story, so deal with it. It's a large flying Shikigami with electrical cursed energy properties which can be discharged to stun or incapacitate opponents. It's also very mobile and can easily carry the weight of the user, making it useful for quickly travelling or escaping. It's also just hella cool. When used by Megami, I would say the Shikigami is around semi-grade 1. I'm giving spot number 12 to Megami's first ever Shikigami, Divine Dogs. They are a loyal pair of cursed spirit hunting dogs that can track and devour most cursed spirits. A special grade curse effortlessly dispatched of one of the dogs though, so their individual base strength is very limited. For their tracking abilities and defensive prowess though, I will give them semi-grade grade 1, maybe grade 2. Naturally, number 11 goes to the new and significantly improved Divine Dog Totality. The White Dog's death meant that the power was transferred to the remaining Black Dog, and they merged to become a much bigger and stronger Divine Dog Totality, with claws capable of penetrating one of the most durable special grade disaster curses, Hanami. Defensively, it still isn't all that, and the attacks are limited to close quarters scratches, but its obvious increase in attack potency and its uses in the series so far allow me to very confidently place it at a grade 1, semi-grade 1 level. I'm gonna start our top 10 by placing Dagon's Death Swarm in 10th place. Obviously, the Shikigami are unique since they are manifested as the guaranteed hit of a Disaster Curse's domain, making them far more dangerous than any other stated so far. However, as seen in the Shibuya arc, anyone with a domain counter can negate the guaranteed hit of Dagon's domain. Although we're here to talk about the Shikigami's strength and not Dagon's domain refinement, so I'm going to continue by assessing Death Swarm's effectiveness without the guaranteed hit, since they did pose a threat to now Beto, Nanami, Maki, and Megami all at the same time. I mean, their attack potent was enough to literally make Nanami look like this. The same man whose reinforcement was compared to a brick wall by the sword using Haruta. Oh, and they also managed to completely sever one of Naobito's arms. Defensively though, they are not really as impressive. Nanami and Maki, both of them being non-special grade sorcerers, were able to slice through even the 
slightly bigger ones once the guaranteed hit was down. They get a bonus point for variation though, since some of them are so big that it would take a very powerful Toji level hit to bring them down. All in all though, I would say that Death Swarm Shikigami without the guaranteed hit are a high grade one. At number 9, I'm placing Piercing Ox, one of Megami's untamed Shikigami, which was later used by Sukuna against Yorozu. It's a very interesting one because it sacrifices versatility for insane power. It's basically the Juggernaut in that it can only run in a straight line, but the more it runs, the more power it gains. Pairing Piercing Ox with a cursed energy powerhouse like Sukuna or a genius like Sukuna or Megami makes Piercing Ox into a very effective Shikigami despite its obvious limitations. Don't forget though that having high cursed energy probably allows it to run incredibly fast, and we've only seen it in the manga so we don't really know how fast it can run. Although if a Heian era sorcerer like Yorozu is getting hit by it, then I'd say it's definitely pretty damn fast. Given the limited time that we've seen of it, and unique mechanics, I don't want to place it any higher than a high grade 1 though. Coming in at number 9 though, we have Megana's Nue plus Orochi. This is the massive Nue and Orochi Shikigami that Sukuna summoned once taking over Megami's body. Due to Sukuna's insane cursed energy, all of his Shikigami are much bigger and stronger than Megami's. This monster not only has the size advantage though, because it also has a significantly more powerful lightning attack in addition to whatever it is that the serpent can do. Unfortunately though, we only see this monster for literally one panel before it's merged with others to become Agito. Due to Megana being the one behind the wheel though, I feel confident giving it a special grade 1 ranking. At number 7, I'm placing Druv's Orbiting Domain Shikigami. Thanks to Yuta Okotsu, we hardly see anything of Druv's Shikigami technique, but we do know how it works and just how dangerous it can be in the right hands. Druv's technique involves two huge floating guinea pig-like Shikigami, which orbit around Druv, creating a domain of sorts. Based off Yuta's application of the Shikigami against Yuro and Sukuna, we can assume that entering the makeshift domain results in many lacerations to the body that are weaker than Cleave. Druv supposedly used this technique to single-handedly conquer the nation at one point in time. His presence in Sendai Colony also forced Kurorushi, Uro, and Ryo to be very cautious of starting a fight. In fact, the fighting in Sendai Colony didn't really start at all until Yuta off-screened him and his Shikigami. Despite the obvious strength of the technique though, my main problem with Druv Shikigami is their size. They are too big and easy of a target, and based off how he died, I have reason to believe that Druv isn't the kind of sorcerer to protect them in close combat himself. However, there is no denying the obvious strengths, especially if you consider Yuta's use of smaller Shikigami when copying the technique against Yuro and Sukuna. Therefore, the domain Shikigami are going to be in special grade 1 as well. Spot number 6 is going to one of Megami's other untamed 10 shadow Shikigami that was recently subjugated by Sukuna, Round Deer. I actually think that Round Deer is the best Shikigami in the 10 shadows except for Maharaga, but then again, no Zenin has ever successfully tamed Maharaga, so maybe Round Deer is just the best Shikigami. This support focus Shikigami constantly runs reverse curse technique to heal itself and the user, meaning the user can summon it and receive healing without having to use any resources performing reverse curse technique themselves. This also means, similar to Maharaga, it requires a one-shot to exercise, since it will be quickly healing from anything less than a one-shot attack. The positive energy it outputs can also interfere with an opponent's cursed energy control to a certain level. For example, when Sukuna summoned Roundier against Yorozu, she lost control over her liquid metal. We aren't really certain of the extent of this ability, but from what we have seen, it's definitely a nice bonus to the already broken healing mechanic. Sukuna also greatly benefited from using Roundier's ability in Merged Beast Agito against Gojo. It was so useful to Sukuna that Gojo determined it a problem and made it his primary goal to exercise Agito first. So, for all the reasons stated above, I'm giving Roundier our first special grade title of the video, and I think it is very deserving and such an underrated Shikigami. Speaking of Agito, this Merged Beast will start off our top 5 by taking 5th place. Nue Totality, Merged Beast Agito, has a base of Nue with the powers of Orochi, Roundier, and Unknown Shikigami Tiger Funeral mixed in. Despite having Nue's electricity and the combined strength of Orochi and Tiger Funeral, the only useful part of this Shikigami when fighting against Sasuro Gojo was again Round Deer's healing. Because I put Round Deer's base form at number 6, it only makes sense that Agito is next because it is basically just a heavily buffed version of Round Deer. You get all of Round Deer's offensive prowess, and then you get Orochi and Tiger Funeral's ability to hold their own in a fight, along with Nui's electricity. Okay, maybe not against Gojo, but against any other non special grade sorcerer, it would put up a terrifying performance. Unfortunately, though, its only fight was in a 3v1 against Satoru Gojo, and let's be honest, Gojo made a complete mockery out of this freaky Hedwig looking mother Still though, Sukuna valuing its use in a fight against Satoru Gojo is definitely good enough evidence for me to smack it alongside Roundia in special grade. At spot number 4, I'm placing Yuki Sukumo's Shikigami Garuda. Now please remember that this list is considering both individual strength and usefulness to its user, because Shikigami are just basically weapons that sorcerers use in their fights against other sorcerers, or cursed spirits. Garuda is the only thing other than Yuki herself that can actually have Star Rage applied to it, and if for some reason you read Yuki's chapters with your eyes closed, I'll give you a quick rundown of what Star Rage is. Star Rage allows for Yuki to grant herself and Garuda any amount of virtual mass, and until reaching a
reaching a very high limit, they themselves are unaffected by the increase in mass. This special grade ability is so strong, it can one-shot one of Kenjaku's favourite special grade curses, Ganesha. Star Rage also allows Yuki and Garuda to pretty much ignore cursed energy reinforcement, as seen when she blew off both of Kenjaku's arms with one single punch. The reason Garuda is so high up on this list is because it is the only thing other than Yuki that can utilise Star Rage. After all, the special grade curse Ganesha was one-shotted by Yuki literally booting Garuda right into its crondolium. It is easily a special grade Shikigami with that broken ass ability. Number three goes to Hiromi Higuruma's domain Shikigami, Judgment. Similar to Yuki and Druv, Judgment is part of Higuruma's curse technique, meaning that they are unbelievably valuable to the user. In Higuruma's case, Judgment is used in his domain to accuse, judge, and sentence any opponent it faces, even Ryoma and Sukuna. The sentences that it can give out are limited by the severity of the crimes it accuses them of. However, when facing an opponent as evil as Ryoma and Sukuna, a deadly sentence is almost guaranteed. Depending on the severity of the crime, Judgment can completely confiscate an opponent's curse technique, leaving them with nothing except basics upon leaving the domain. Furthermore, it can issue a death sentence, providing Higuruma with a sword that literally kills the second it so much as scratches the defenseless opponent. The primary problem with Judgment's confiscation, though, is it is subject to Gege's arse pullage, meaning anyone with a cursed tool has that confiscated instead of their cursed technique. And then there is the matter of Judgment only being capable of supplying Higuruma with the means to defeat his opponent, which was of course limited by his lack of combat experience when facing Ryom and Sukuna. That being said though, its insane ability to confiscate techniques have it easily in special grade. Okay, I need you guys to take a deep breath before I reveal number two, because I know a lot of you are going to have problems with it, but you will be fine if you just try and hear me out, okay? Please. At number two, I have put Maharaga. Now number two and number one are totally interchangeable given how you look at it, and there is definitely a worthy argument for placing Maharaga at number one. He is an absolute monster with the blade of extermination and ability to adapt to literally anything, meaning a one-shot is absolutely necessary to exercise him. No Zenin clan member with the Ten Shadows technique has ever managed to tame Maharaga in all of history, and in the past he was able to defeat both the Zenin clan head and Gojo clan head, who was a six-size limitless user just like Satoru Gojo. Even Sukuna admitted that if he had fought Maharaga back at Three Fingers, then he very well just could have lost the fight. Maharaga's insane ability to adapt was also Sukuna's primary strategy for fighting Satoru Gojo, the strongest sorcerer of the modern age. Unlike previous six size limitless users though, Maharaga itself barely made Gojo break a sweat even in a 1v3, but ultimately it was Maharaga's adaptation that led to Gojo's defeat at Frokuna's hands. Obviously Maharaga is a very very high special grade Shikigami. I am actually going to move on to number one now, but we are going to circle back to Maharaga when I explain my logic here. Okay, everyone take another deep breath for me, please. That's it. Perfect. Number one goes to Rika, the Queen of Curses. Yep, I said it. Here's what it is. Rika's number one. Deal with it. Now, before you lot take to the comments and start shaking and sweating, I just want to confirm that yes, Rika is technically a Shikigami following the events of Volume Zero when the curse was broken by Yuta Okotsu. Rika is also titled the Queen of Curses for a reason due to her supposedly endless pool of cursed energy. Both Satoru Gojo and Ryom and Sukuna acknowledge this title, and Gojo even stated that a curse with as much curse energy as Rika is near impossible to exercise. Individually, Rika has insanely strong reinforced attacks and defenses capable of blocking Granite Blast with her bare hands and shrugging off close range dismantles like they're nothing. Considering Rika all on her own though, I am going to agree that she should be number two and Maharaga should be number one. Did you hear that? I said I agree. Maharaga number one, all right? relax. However, I do have two very important arguments for why Rika should not be judged in isolation, but always alongside Yuta Okotsu. First of all, as we have discussed with every other Shikigami, the ranking is about usefulness to the sorcerer as well as individual strength. With the exception of Ryoman Sukuna, who hijacked the use of the technique, no sorcerer born with the Ten Shadow technique has ever successfully tamed it, making it completely worthless to the user for all but one thing. As shown when the Zenin and Gojo clan heads fought, all Maharaga is good for is kamikazeing and guaranteeing that every everybody loses. Rika, on the other hand, has their soul bound to Yuta's through love, making her the perfect weapon against his opponents. Their ability to connect and for Rika to become fully manifested also adds a lot of value to her, which is my next point. When ranking sorcerers, Yuta is never considered in isolation. He is always paired with Rika because Rika is more than just another basic Shikigami technique. Their souls are literally bound. They are one force fighting together, as opposed to Shikigami techniques which are summoned as nothing more than a means to win. Just like Yuta, Rika can only release her full potential when connected to Yuta, which is a very unique mechanic that does not apply to all other Shikigami users. When connected, Rika fully manifests, allowing Yuta to access his copy technique and access an endless pool of cursed energy. And if that does not count as usefulness to the user, then I do not know what f*** 
does. When connected, the pair can also fire a very high output love beam, which can be further strengthened via binding vowels. And yes, I do believe the love beam at full power would be enough to one-shot Maharaga, because if it isn't, then literally Sukuna and Gojo are the only sorcerers I can think of capable of one-shotting Maharaga, which makes absolutely no sense. As I explained, Yuta and Rika are a unique case where they should be considered together. It's kind of their whole thing. I do think the pair can defeat Maharaga, but to be fair, Maharaga definitely does compare to or even exceed Rika in individual strength. However, due to how the Ten Shadows works, Maharaga is literally only useful to Sukuna and only really against Gojo since Sukuna can do fine on his own against anybody else. Nobody except Sukuna in all of history has ever managed to tame Maharaga. Now that I've said all of this, I will make it completely clear for you lot who disagree with what I'm saying. If we completely remove Yuta from the equation, then base Rika almost definitely loses to Maharaga, meaning you absolutely can have Maharaga in number one if you want, but I have chosen to put Yuta and Rika together since that's just kind of how they work and I felt like it was wrong not to. I also know that despite me constantly explaining how I'm assessing them and all of my reasoning, JJK nerds will always choose to ignore it and only listen to the stuff worth arguing to. So I very much encourage you to go and give all of your thoughts in the comments below. I always look forward to seeing how dead wrong I am. On a serious note though, I genuinely do enjoy reading all of your comments and discussing stuff with you guys, even when some of you disagree with me. I think it's just more interesting that way. I would rather people disagree than agree with everything I say. As always, don't forget to like and sub. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time. Thank f that's over. It took me way too long to record this. I just cannot speak English today.